Yes, greetings. Uh, my name is Rupert Ojiji Harvey from the band Messenger. Um, I've been, I'm the lead vocalist and leader. We, we, were, we formed in about 1982. And uh, right now we're still in the recording studio, just working on a new project. We took a break during the, uh, the COVID thing. And hopefully by this summer, we'll be releasing something new. So that's me. What were your memories of living in Jamaica? My memories, great. You know, live, where I lived, it was very peaceful, very nice. I, I grew up on a, literally on a farm up in the mountains with my grandparents, you know. So I was a real farm boy, put it that way. Just getting up early every morning to take care of cows and, you know, chickens and all this kind of stuff before going to school. So my experience, uh, you know, I think that instilled a certain love of nature in me, you know, like to this day, like I love going out into the woods and doing a campaign and stuff like that. I'm one of the rare ones that I see when I'm out there. <laughs> because that's what I grew up with. So, you know, I'm now I'm in the Canadian woods, you know, but um, yeah, it's something I'm very, I'm very familiar with surviving out there in the wilderness and stuff. What was your introduction to music? Well, music ran in my family. My dad was a very good keyboard player. Uh, you know, as you know, most musicians, both in reggae and in R&B funk, came from out of the church, you know. So my, my dad was an organ player uh, and a piano, pianist, and he, you know, played for the church. He had a choir and stuff. So it was I was kind of born into into that talent that my from my dad, you know. And um, from a young age, maybe like eight eight years old, I started singing with one of the folk choirs at my school in Jamaica. So we used to sing Jamaican folk music, and then we traveled to a couple of different schools and do performances and thing and thing like that, you know. And what do you remember when you first moved to Canada? Yeah, I mean, my first impression was, I mean, luckily, I, I wasn't like one of the Jamaicans that came in the wintertime and, and came, stepped off a plane into an icebox. I actually, I came in uh, in August, which is like the hottest month here, and I thought it was cold. I, I was wearing a sweater. <laughs> <laughs> I said, is this winter, mom? <laughs> little did i know what was awaiting a few months down the road yeah so my first impression was you know wow place is huge you know buildings I, i'm a country boy i grew up you know we didn't have too many high rises where i came from you know so i don't know if you guys know but toronto is a big city you know i think just the jamaican population in toronto is over like three hundred thousand. and what was the music scene like at that time in canada when I came here, um, I don't know, like I was a school kid, you know, so I was just, just listening to the radio, was just like top 40, you know, rock, you know. Like I grew up listening to what, you know, all the people from that age. Uh, you know, I mean, of course, I remembered my ska music that I brought in my, in my head from Jamaica at the time. And then Rocksteady came up after that. But here it was, you know, top 40, pop and metal, you know. We were kids listening to like Zeppelin and Black Sabbath and all this kind of stuff, like everybody else. But you know, my, my musical thing was very diverse because um, you know, my father played a lot of Caribbean music like Belafonte, you know, Harry Belafonte, who just oh, rest in peace, he just passed away recently. Right. And um then my brother got me into jazz at a very early age, you know, listening to people like Weather Report and then got into funk, you know, listening to um Tower of Power, East Bay, Greece. So my musical background is very varied and it's because of the environment, you know what I mean? When I was in Jamaica, Jamaican people love our local music and believe it or not, they love country. You know, Johnny Cash, Dolly Parton, all these people are huge in Jamaica. You know, I think to this day, country is popular down there. So that's that was on the radio in Jamaica, you know, stuff like that. What was the first band that you were in? Okay, so when we were kids in uh, public school, we started a little band. This is you know, just like a little startup thing with my classmates. We did a little thing called Naya, and that was the first time. I think I was around, what was I, like 13, 14. Got some guys together. We were playing, uh, we were playing some reggae at the time with a, with a little bit, you know, little bit of um, parliament, <laughs> a, a very big gap, you know, but... We, we used to love the old old P funk stuff, so yeah. we we played some reggae, and then next thing you know, we're playing some funkadelics. You know, well after that, when I was like around 16, 17, going close to seventeen, 
I, you know, as, as most of us at home practicing my guitar, my brother Carl Harvey, who was a very famous guitar player, um, you know, went on to play with Toots and the Maytales for almost 40 years. He was my big inspiration. So we used to sit and practice, 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 you know, even when I didn't feel like practicing. Carl, I want to go outside and play. No, you're going to sit here and practice. My big brother, that, yeah, that's the way we roll. So I got a phone call one day because I went to school with this guy named Mark Smith, and he got a gig playing with an R&B band called the Cougars, and they were on tour. And while they were on tour, they lost their guitar player. So they, Mark says, hey, I know this kid in Toronto is a good guitar player. He's not doing anything. So I get a phone call. Hey, you want to fly out to this um, city called Thunder Bay and uh, be in this new band? I'm going, what? It's my first gig. Right from my apartment to be in, a, to be in, the, in the big league pros with people like Jack Me Too, who was that you know, legendary keyboard player who, you know, who went on to produce musical youth. And he became a uh, musical godfather. My, you know, so my first recording on a record was with him when I was like around 16 years old. So, so yeah, it was my first experience playing with a band called the Cougars, playing like, you know, stuff like stylistics, you know, all old R&B, Stevie Wonder stuff, you know, really complicated, you know, like with the chord changes and all that. So I was like, I was nervous, but I didn't even get it. They didn't even give me a rehearsal. I literally flew in that day, no rehearsal. And I was on stage that night. They, they just kind of told me the song, sang the melodies, gave me the, some of the chord changes, and I wrote it down in my hand. So as I was playing, I put my palm up and tried to look at some of the chords. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, yeah, that was my... I'll never forget that. That's burnt into the memory, you know? Yeah, so we went on, we went on and did some tour dates with that band, and I, I think I was with them for about a year before they broke up. Then from then, I uh, came, you know, came back into Toronto. I was really bored, and I was... I really miss that life of being on stage in front of all these people, you know, being a young kid, getting all the accolades, right? So me and the trombone player, Trevor Daly, and the bass player, Mark Smith, we um, we went around looking for other players. And then from there, we found this band called Crack of Dawn. And that was in 1972, I believe, we started. We're young guys, man. And... Um, a couple of years later, we got discovered by CBS Records from other New York. They send um, they sent a producer to Canada called um, Bob Gallo, same guy that produced Otis Redding, sitting at the dock of the bay. So that was our first producer. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, we and we then became the first black band in the history of Canada to be signed to a major rec recording label. We actually then became pretty much one of the first black groups who to be played on on public, you know nationally radio hit you know hit the charts and we're you know we're you know selling pretty big we had a nice contract with them until a few years down the road we toured all all the major venues across the country like massive concerts and um you know bands always have inside politics right so uh, the record label they have a way of dividing you know so they started whispering in the lead singer here, yeah, you don't need these guys, you know, we'll back you, you know. They, they said that we sounded too much like Earth, Wind & Fire, so they wanted us to fire the horn section. Because they, they, yeah, they came to a concert in Montreal, a place called Place des Arts, one of the most prestigious venues in the country. And and the reps from New York came up and, you know, we, we were we were uh, doing a date there with, with another artist from the UK. And my trombone player overheard them saying, man, these guys sound too much at like Earth and Fire, you know, they're, and you're competing with the, with them in Canadian market, right? So they wanted us to fire the horn section. So the horn guys just left. We didn't have to fire them. They felt so hurt. And then rhythm section went on for a while with the lead singer Glenn Ricks or Glenn Ricketts at the time. No, his name is Glenn Ricks, and that didn't last long because we didn't feel we didn't feel good about it. So you know that's it. So we left and. The band that had so much potential and was like a history-making band in this country just drifted apart because of inside politics with record labels. Trust me. Yeah, that ended in 1976. So we were signed in. So, yeah, so we were signed and toured for a couple of years. We were just about to be embarking on a tour to Europe with the Whalers, actually, with, with Bob, because uh, his manager at the time got in touch with us and he was interested in managing the act. Even though we we're playing a different kind of music, the fact that we were Jamaicans, you know, really interested them that we could actually play like this, you know, and, you know, 
be like, like I said, like the Earth, Earth, Wind, and Fire of Canada. We actually outsold Earth, Wind, and Fire up here. And so after that, was that when you started the um, OGG project? Yeah, after that, you know, I did I, I did the OGG project. I wanted to just do something, go back to my old roots of doing a lot of jazz. But then I infused reggae into it. So I did like kind of, if you listen to OGG Halfway Home, a lot of it is a jazz reggae fusion. The first one was um, more contemporary jazz at the time with some African vibe to it. Uh, that was called, that's my first album called OGG The Shadow. Both of those albums ended up doing very, very good as far as um, licensing deals for, for movie soundtracks and was actually used on our national television station here sometime for background music. So, yeah, 1979, I think I started recording that. I started writing that stuff when I was like 16 years old, you know? Um, yeah, all those complex arrangements and stuff. I already had that in my head. And... Uh, after after that, we we started a little band called Inner Flame, and it was a, a really good band. We actually only stayed together for a couple of years, but in a couple of years, we, we ended up recording and never releasing it. But we we won like you know re reggae band of the year up here at that time, and uh, we ended up opening up for Third World at um, Massey Hall when they came to Canada. And uh, yeah, then after that fell apart, I left Toronto moved up to this little town called Kitchener. I, I met this guy, Eric Walsh. He introduced me to some, to uh, Errol Blackwood, who became the other co-founder and this band called Messenger came out of that. So yeah, we just started jamming in a the basement. Then we we uh, we got a gig at this little uh, motor inn, you know? First time no one heard of us. So when we got, when we got there, we did our show, there was like you know, 20, 30 people in the venue. But we still did such a wicked show that they hired us back for the following week. The next week when we went back there, bro, there was a lineup outside the club. You couldn't even get in. Just from word of mouth from the like the 20 people that were there the first time. And that's how we got our start. We got blown up. And then the, the universities, you know, started picking us up and we started touring all over the universities. And then that's when Warner Brothers approached us. And then we became the first reggae band in Canada to be signed to a major record label. Warner Electra, you know, WEA. Yeah. So I've been, I've been blessed to be historical on both sides of the, the funk and reggae. We opened the door and we opened the whole country for all of those that came after us. And unfortunately, people have short memories. So, you know, we don't get that knowledge unless we do an interview like this. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, we, yeah, I got, we got some award um, a couple of years ago from one of the universities um, called the Trailblazer, Trailblazers Award from, I think it was Ryerson University. It's called Impact. It's for Canadian, people that made an impact in the Canadian music industry. So yeah, I think we still get a lot of respect, but you know, we're we're uh, we're really low key guys. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> we're just we're just staying low. And now we're in the studio recording, and we we got some nice things happening. <laughs>